Well, hello. Um, great joy to be here. My God, you're all sad. I understand this is the last session of the... Why, why on earth are you here? Um, now, uh, it is uh, my uh, joy, privilege, uh, to be here talking to my old friend Ian Katz. He rang me a, about five or six weeks ago and, and asked if I would uh, talk to him here at this distinguished festival. And I, my initial thought was... Are you completely mad? Uh, I've known uh, Ian, uh, what, I think we were, you were sort of 12, I was 16 on a, perhaps one of the more distinguished uh, newspapers that no longer exists, shortest lived, something called the Sunday Correspondent, uh, and he's uh, a, a very old friend. And the great thing about interviewing friends is it can only end badly. I was um, coming to the same conclusion, actually. Um, now, uh, let's start with, uh, uh, you know, the sort of the big general questions. Like me, you're a middle class, middle aged, Oxbridge educated uh, individuals who spent a lifetime in the dying newspaper industry, a, a secular Jew. I mean, the obvious question to ask is, A, do you understand English irony? And secondly, um, <laughs> no day can go by when you presumably, like me, don't feel completely obsolete. Um, what do you bring, effectively, as director of programmes, apart from a total lack of obviously relevant experience? <laughs> well, thanks for that uh, fantastically generous introduction. Um, I'm just reflecting on my obsolescence. I was sitting a little bit earlier in the... Um, in the question time debate, um, listening to my rather brilliant deputy, Kelly Webb Lamb, who's none of the things you just described, talking about the industry being full of uh, white mediocrities. So uh, um, I was sitting there wondering if I was one of those already. Um, look, I think, what do I bring to the industry? You've known me a long time. I think that if you talk to people who've worked with me over the years in newspapers at the BBC, I hope the sort of things they would say uh, are that I have a passion for and yen for creating mischief, for whether it's trying to interfere in an American election or getting Kirsty Walk to dance to Thrill at the end of a news night, that I, I thrive and, and on and love ventilating arguments, uh, often really difficult arguments to have, starting arguments, telling different difficult stories, breaking and nurturing new talent has always been the sort of heart of, of what I've tried to do in, in journalism. And I hope that those are the threads at the heart of, of Channel 4's DNA, really. And I, and I am, a, I'm, I, honestly, I'm a, I'm a sort of Channel 4 fanboy man and child. I grew up with it, unlike most of the people I now work with. I remember the first day I was full of excitement in its first few years, and it's in many ways sort of shaped my view of the world. Um, so although I've never worked for Channel 4, I feel I have a bit of Channel 4 in my blood. Now, what I do want is this not only to be a conversation between us, but a conversation with you. So do use your apps, please. Uh, and if you send in a question that I don't regard as unspeakably dull, I will try and... Uh, ask it, and yes, do take it personally if I don't ask your question. Um, uh, and so, and we'll sort of I'm going to sort of basically talk to Ian in sort of three parts, sort of general stuff, who is he? Then we're going to move on to a bit about his commissioning priorities, and then I think we'll talk a little bit about this whole diversity challenge. So, you know, have, have a think along the way about, you know, uh, sort of slightly more interesting and intelligent questions than I'll be asking. Um, Tell me a bit about your years at The Guardian. Um, you were a champion uh, of taking The Guardian online, and for uh, quite a long period, I think one would say Guardian was very much ahead of the curve when it came to uh, embracing the digital revolution, although notoriously it was a very expensive uh, adventure in that area. What, 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 what was, what's relevant to, to what you did then, to what you're doing now? 
Well, slightly horrifyingly, I realised the other day that it's almost exactly 20 years since I was involved in, in launching The Guardian uh, on the internet. Uh, and I, and I, it did make me think that I've actually spent the last 20 years of my career, one way or another, wrestling with how linear, analog media institutions translate into a, a world where their, their audiences are moving to digital. Um, that was very much the dominant theme of the last sort of 10 or 15 years of my career at The Guardian. And in many ways, we're now looking as an industry at, at the same challenge. We know our audiences are increasingly wanting to watch things on digital. The challenge is how we are the people who serve that to them on digital and that they are not watching it elsewhere on an SVOD. And how, by the way, the, the, the thing that is really the common thread with, with, with newspapers is how you grow your digital audiences substantially, grow your digital revenues while not destroying your incredibly healthy and successful linear businesses. Um, now, just, just a few days ago at the book festival, uh, a Jeremy Corbyn fan asked him uh, what, what single book uh, Jeremy Corbyn would recommend he read, and 15 minutes later, no book had been mentioned. Um, uh, what I'd like to know from you, I think we'd all like to know, are, you know, what have your favourite TV programmes been? Recently, ever? Ever, ever and recently. Okay. Um, so my... my my great loves on Channel 4, I started uh, watching The Tube as a, as a teenager, not because I really liked it, but because it seemed unbelievably painfully cool, and I thought it made me cool to watch it too. Um, I've loved some of the political drama on Channel 4 over the years, GBH, A Very British Coup. Uh, I am an absolute, uh, slightly tragic uh, Brass Eye fan. Um, I think we've made some unbelievable television on Channel 4 in the last, you know, five or ten years. I think, I think Have you ever watched another channel? <laughs> I used to watch an awful lot of late night BBC Two for the last uh, four years. Um, but just recently, I've, 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 uh, I've adored uh, Unforgotten. Uh, it's taken up a rather large chunk of my life in the last couple of weeks uh, on, on, on ITV. I'm deeply jealous of... Um, of um, the stripping show. Um, Which one? Um, li um, Give us a clue. What's it called? Someone had multi full multi live on uh, on ITV, which I thought yeah. is the single thing I'm most jealous of anywhere on television. Um, what else have I been watching recently? I I've loved keeping faith on BBC One, um, not least because I think there's this really interesting conversation going on about the cost of drama and how we can make drama on uh, modest budgets that don't require massive international co-productions. And the fascinating thing about Keeping Faith is that it's an S4C drama made for roughly half the price of the kind of drama that uh, most of the networks have been making for years. So I found that fascinating. I've loved on Sky recently, uh, Save Me, I think is one of the best pieces of drama I've seen. Enough? Well, look, let's come back to some of those issues, particularly the cost of drama in a minute or two, but um, this is probably a good moment, I think, if anybody in the gallery is listening to me, um, to show a little bit of what you are planning for the next year. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm told it's a, it's a, it's a custom at the, at the festival to show highlights of the last few months, and I thought since we've had wonderful television on Channel 4 in the last few months, but none of it, none of it associated history, with you. I thought I'd just give you a taste of, of what we've got coming and that I'm really proud of. Well, that round of applause is very encouraging. Um, uh, what would success in this job look like to you? I guess I'd look at it two ways. Um, I think structurally the challenge we've got is that, as you touched on a minute ago, our viewers, and especially our young viewers, uh, are moving towards digital. Uh, and we've got to catch their attention in digital at roughly or better than the rate 
that we're losing it in linear. Uh, and we increasingly at Channel 4 are thinking not about overnights so much, but about how much time are people spending with Channel 4, wherever it is, are on, on, on linear, on catch-up, on, on demand, even on social, and we're trying to come up with sensible, meaningful metrics that allow us to say, are people spending the same amount of time or more time with us? So I think one, can I just, one can measure I, of success... Can, can, but can I just ask, because it's related to this, your conventional uh, market share, uh, you know, measured in the way that the industry has done for donkey's years, halved over 10 years, it's what, currently 5%, it's been stuck there for the last couple of years. Any chance of getting it up? Is that part of it? I reject that. I, I, think, I, I think that's a very um, unfair way to put it. I mean, how often they, puts it, so, you know. Well, so here's another way of looking at it. That Channel 4 was traditionally at, at around 10%. When the uh, explosion of digital channels happened, Channel 4 diversified, created a portfolio of digital channels, and our portfolio of channels is still at around 10%. It's been a remarkable defense of share. Uh, over the last few years, and I think the extraordinary thing when you, when you look at the numbers is how stable Channel 4 share has been and the portfolio share has been, and frankly, the, the, the most extraordinary thing is if you look at a... Stable is stagnation. Uh, Any chance of getting it up? Well, I, 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 think, I think looking at linear shares and asking that question is not terribly helpful. I think if, you might ask, for instance, whether you could increase your young share. Now, one of the, one of the things I'm really interested in is that in, in what's been an incredibly competitive year, with, huge World Cup, in which England did far better than they were supposed to, uh, huge Love Island, Channel 4's share of young viewers is about 5% up this year. Now, I see that as incredibly encouraging sign of what we might be able to do. That's why I've put more resourcing into E4, which is um, aimed at, at driving our, our young viewers, appointing a new controller of E4 to do that. So I think there's real, there's real scope to do that. But, th but those are all numbers. Yeah. You asked me what success would look like. For me, success would look like people really, really feeling in their guts that Channel 4 mattered and that they had to be aware of what was on it. They had to, they were talking about it, arguing about it. Um, it was putting, I, I, I've always said all through my journalistic career, at the end of almost every week, did we put waves in the pond this week? Channel 4 has got to put waves in the pond every week and every month. Uh, and for me, that's almost the most important thing. Is there a, is, is there a sense that we have... The, the, the phrase, the national conversation... So I is that risk-taking? Do you want to take more risks? Uh, I think risk, risk is, a, is a part of it. I mean, the, 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 the way we will do that, I think, is by being a stronger flavour all around. And risk-taking is part of that flavour. Um, d diversity and genuine diversity of, of voice, of background... Uh, of, of subject as part of that flavor. Um, and I think that, I mean, I, I, I wanted to be a channel where we, we run towards danger. We can, run can towards ask, in difficult that context, subjects. Is, in that context, and more widely, is, is being a, a PSB a burden or an advantage? Uh, I would say it's overwhelmingly an advantage. Um, because? Well, and this is a kind of key thing. I mean, it, you know, at the moment, we have a degree of protected prominence because we have a position on the EPG in exchange for the commitments that we make around uh, news and, and current affairs and, 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 and other original programming commitments. And that, that is a huge advantage. I mean, um, some of the streamers, uh, with all their advantages, would kill for the, the position of number four um, on the EPG. The challenge, as you know, is that in a world where smart tellies are coming out mm. with Netflix tiles on the front page... You're not on the front page. How do, we, how do we preserve that prominence? And that's why Channel 4 and the BBC and other broadcasters have been arguing that, that, that we need some way of extending that guarantee of prominence into a world of, of, of smart TVs. And Ofcom also says that there's got to be much more cooperation between the PSBs if you're going to meet the challenge of the, you know, video on demand giants with their enormous budgets. Are those talks happening? What, what, what would partnership with the other PSBs look like for you? 
Well, we're, I mean, you, I just gave you an example. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 the um, joined up discussion that we're having around prominence is a perfect mm. example of exactly the collaboration that I think Ofcom are talking about. More global you know, the, marketing together, do you think? Uh, I mean, that's not something I've, I've specifically thought or talked about. Uh, look, clearly, we all have challenges of scale. I sat in a meeting, uh, in, a, in a session a little earlier, the question time, at which there was a conversation about whether the BBC is big enough to compete um, in the new world, and we are a fraction of the size of the BBC. So there's clearly um, a lot of thinking that has to happen around aggregation of content. We are partnering, we've already uh, signed a partnership with Vice, where we have Vice content on our uh, on-demand site, all four. We've got lots of other conversations going on with other uh, potential partners. Aggregation is obviously one way that you can look at, 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 at increasing scale. Um, there is a question here specifically in this context about the future, the plans for all four. What are your plans? Well, making it a lot bigger, mostly. <laughs> um, we want to really try and uh, turbocharge the growth of all four. And there's a whole range of levers that we're trying to pull to do that, right? So some of those are about functionality and about making sure that, that a user's experience with it is as close as we can get it to the kinds of uh, platforms that are spending billions of dollars on, the, on their technology, so, that, so we're investing substantially, sadly not to the tune of billions, but substantially in the technology of, of all four. But some of it is about looking really clear, carefully at our content on linear and asking which, which genres, which types of content are really flying on, on demand. So one of the most interesting examples in the last few weeks is um, the Sasha Baron Cohen show, uh, Who is America, mm. which is one of the first shows that we've had which is now being viewed more on demand than it is on linear. About 56% of our young viewing uh, of uh, Who is America is on uh, all four. And we are now starting, I, th I think for the first time, to take decisions when we sit down and consider whether to commission something or recommission recomm something we're having to look in the round and say, well, maybe this didn't do that brilliantly on linear for us, but maybe we'll do it again because actually it's going to drive out uh, on-demand viewing substantially. The problem, of course, is that linear has an, establ an established revenue model and there is more of a challenge getting money out of on-demand digital. Exactly. I mean, that, that, but look, the really good news, you asked me about my newspaper experience before. Yeah. The really good news is that when we were wrestling with exactly this problem in the news business, the deep problem we were facing was that the value of a pair of eyeballs to an advertiser was shattered in the move from print to online. I can't even remember what the proportion was, but you went from advertising that was worth pounds to advertising that was worth pence. The, the, the really profound difference... Uh, in broadcasting, and, and I think this is, a, this is certainly true at Channel 4, I don't know about other broadcasters, but, but we value a pair of eyeballs on all four and on demand the same as we value a pair of eyeballs on, on linear, and the advertisers are willing to pay the same. So at the moment, about 10% of our viewing is on all four, and roughly 10% of our revenue uh, comes through all, all, through all four. So that sounds about right. So if you say to yourself, well, could we get that digital up to... 20 or 30% and get the revenue to follow it, that would be terrific. The catch is that the revenue is not moving out of the traditional ad market at the same speed as the growth in uh, digital. And that's the difficult balancing act that we, we have to do. We, we know our viewers' habits are changing, um, but the revenue isn't following quite as fast, and, and that's the balancing act we've got to strike. Now, in terms of your own commissioning, this is a very, very easy question for you. Would you have bid for Bake Off? Well, obviously. Um, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very easy question to answer now. Um, look, I, I, I am so, full... So, so you think it's reasonable for PSBs to get into bidding wars for established formats? Yes, absolutely. I mean, doesn't look, that just I, push, I, I, doesn't I, that just me, push me, up me, the cost me, for me, all me, of you? Is me, it, is it, is it, isn't that commercial suicide for all of you? Can I, can I just backtrack a second? Yeah. Because I, I think it's, um, it's glib for me to say now, of course I would have bid for Bake Off because it's, it, it's, it's wisdom after the event. I think it was an incredibly bold um, and, and um, 
uh, far-seeing decision, I would like to think I would have done the same thing. I'm certainly extremely grateful <laughs> that Jay and, and the, the, the previous management of, 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 of Channel 4 took that decision. Um, look, we, we are in a market, which Channel 4 operates uh, as a commercial broadcaster. We are in a market all the time, every day, for talent. We are bidding against uh, Netflix some days, and other days we're bidding against the BBC. And uh, uh, Bake Off was just a very big piece of business. Um. That's interesting. So this is quite relevant. This is a sort of relevant question, I think. Um, this, this question is: Why did most people think that End of the Fucking World was a Netflix show, even though it was on your platform quite a while before it was up on Netflix? Was the channel not confident about it? Will you get behind it properly for the next series? I think that's a really interesting question, and it's a problem that that, that, that we're all grappling with. I think in the industry, which is where attribution fall in a world where the same shows may be popping up on different platforms at different times in different territories and where, naming no names, uh, some streaming friends uh, have quite forceful approaches to attributing shows as their own. Um, the, the End of the End of Fucking World, which is one of my absolute favourite shows, mm. Uh, was launched in a kind of interesting and I think imaginative way on Channel 4. It's before my time, so I can't, I can't comment on, on, mm. on the thinking in detail, but the way it was launched was a single episode was run on uh, Channel 4 on linear, and then it was box set and released on, on all four. It's a really interesting experiment in what um, the impact of box setting looks like uh, on our on demand, and actually it is still the most successful box set that, that, that Channel 4 has run. Uh, it then ran out on Netflix, I think about three months later, uh, and a huge amount of people saw it for the first time on Netflix. Um, so it's perhaps not surprising that a lot of people, it probably said Netflix original on it, it's not surprising a lot of people thought it was a Netflix show. I'm thrilled, and in fact, uh, we, we just announced it at, at Edinburgh this week, that we're making a End of the Fucking World 2, uh, which will come out next year, mm. and next time we'll do it differently. We will run the whole series on the channel, uh, and and will you run it as event? Be... Will you run it as event TV, as it were, initially? Before you won't put, you won't put the whole series. Will you put the whole series up again? Will we for, box for... it in one go? Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's another discussion. Haven't, haven't haven't got anywhere near that yet. The point is, it will run out as a linear series on Channel Four, and then there will be a conventional holdback yeah. uh, of more than a year before people see it on Netflix. So I do look. It really bugs me that people think that show is a Netflix show. I really want to reclaim ownership of it. It is absolutely a Channel 4 show. Um, in bro broadcast this week, you were reported as saying that your commissioning team will, in quotes, embrace honest, candid, and potentially awkward conversations with suppliers. What does that mean? Well, look, the first, I mean, because I'm substantially new to this industry, one of the first things I did when I started was see as many producers as I could and say, what's it like working with us? Um, against a background where I think, in a world where we're competing with streamers with gazillions of, of, of pounds, plus all the traditional competitors, we have got to be the most attractive creative partner, because we're never going to be the one with the deepest pockets. Mm. So I said to everyone, what's it like working with us? How do you find us? And um, people uh, unloaded, unsurprisingly, and uh, we had a leaders session yesterday which touched on some of the themes that came up, whether they were, I mean, essentially, we want you to be quicker, make your mind up quicker, communicate quicker, be clearer, be a bit less interfery, be a bit less centralized. Those are the sort of themes that came through. And I then did exactly the same exercise um, uh, with one of my colleagues um, in, in commissioning. Mm and said, how does it feel to you? And, and people had a different set of gripes again, with some of which got uh, shown on screens yesterday, yeah. ranging from you know, not delivering quite against specs to execs not looking at cuts. Mm. And, and what we tried to do is to say, right, first of all, we're going to sit down and try and write down how we want to work together. And I produced a document, which I know you'll have read forensically, uh, called The Creative Partnership, which we published this week which is a really sincere attempt to try and spell out how we want to work together and to say, look, we get it. We, we, we've got to be 
we've got to be quicker, we've got to be more reactive, we're going to do our best, but it's a two-way street, and here's some things that we're going to expect from you. And all of that, to come to your quote, mm. only works against a mutual understanding that we're going to have a relationship of candor and we're going to talk to each other as partners rather than as producers uh, and buyers. And so, uh, I mean, what I've really tried to do in the document and uh, at any opportunity is to say, just, just talk to us. Tell us, when we're, tell, us, tell us when we're not being quick enough. Tell us when someone hasn't called you to tell you what's happening to their idea. Tell us when we've crossed the line in terms of being too interfery um, so that we can find our way to a more collaborative relationship. I mean, mo both of us have worked for a whole series of, of media organisations. Uh, one is tempted to say that, you know, it's very easy to talk this kind of talk, but how are you going to actually monitor? You know, you're saying, well, you know, tell us when we're not up to scratch, but have you got a system for actually monitoring whether you're living up to these commitments? Well, we've got, we've got a, an incredibly granular system that looks at, for instance, the time, this is going to get very boring for you, Robert, but that, that, that looks at the, the time that each part of the process takes. So I have spent over the last couple of months quite a few hours poring over charts that show from a conditional green light to an ed spec being completed to BARB, which is our approvals mm. panel approving it, to a contract being issued. How long is each stage of that process? You see, you really didn't want to go here. No, no, no. Curiously, uh, this is the most interesting thing you've said so far. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have that data in some detail. And so we know where the, we know where the log jams are, and right. we will monitor it. And you are genuinely monitoring and, and it. And frankly, on a, yeah. one, and, and one thing that was very clear from, matters. from yesterday is that this, this festival is monitoring all that stuff incredibly closely. And I'm sure next year I'm going to be um, held up rather um, fiercely against all the things that I've said about it this year. Now, I want to move on. Uh, to diversity, um, and you don't need to tell me because you know we all know that on certainly Ofcom's measures, some elements of diversity Channel Four does well, uh, whether it's gender or ethnic. You do pretty well compared to the others. Possibly not well enough because the industry doesn't do well enough. But you're, you know you are doing better than some of your competitors. But there was a report this week that identified Channel 4 as the poshest employer. Um, embarrassing? Yeah. Um, embarrassing and quite shocking. Um, I only hesitate on the quite because the piece of work that produced those headlines was a Channel 4 commissioned piece of research by Sam Friedman uh, at the LSE. And actually, so Channel 4 actually commissioned the research? We commissioned the, oh, okay. the Well, it's a refinement of a piece of yeah. research that we commissioned, and, and we actually published that right. um, three or four months ago uh, in Glasgow. And that was really the first look at the um, social Class. background yeah. makeup of not just the broadcasters, but producers as well. And basically, that, the, the headline figure, uh, which we released earlier this year, was that the industry is really shockingly posh. Mm -hmm. um, the new bit is we are... The poshest. the poshest of the posh, and it's and it and, and it's it's genuinely shocking. The, I, I suppose the bit, um, uh, to some extent, um, it's not surprising that class has not been um, one of the things that that it, it, it's it's not a protected characteristic. It's not been something that's been measured in the way that uh, other protected characteristics have been for the last few years. So the spotlight hasn't been on it. So all the attention that has been given to trying to improve diversity in other areas mm. hasn't yet uh, been applied to um, uh, uh, back, uh, social background, economic background. It now must be. Um, yeah. uh, and, and um, you know, social mobility in this country is lamentably poor. Class, I think, w would, would, I think, by many of us be seen as the last great impediment to... Uh, advancement. I adored. I thought it was. I thought Michaela Cole's McTaggart lecture was absolutely magnificent. Um, and there was in her plea for what she described as misfits. It did seem to me that there was a subtext that some of these barriers are indeed. You know, they are. They're, they're, they're importantly class 
barriers. Yeah. So, so, what, so, 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 you know, you say you, you're, in, you're ashamed of this, you're embarrassed about this, but, you know, you, you like me, as we've already established, are middle-class white male. Um, right, what are you going to do and about it? secular Jew, as you pointed out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, look, uh, um, for me, the kind of uh, real wake-up call in Michaela's pretty extraordinary lecture um, was in, in flagging up the, the difference between representation and genuine inclusion. Because as you say, you touched on the, 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 the Ofcom reports and so on, Channel 4 does pretty well on representation on screen, pretty well actually uh, in terms of the makeup of our staff. But what Michaela, what I was hearing in, in Michaela's speech was, was her saying, um, even those of us misfits, to use her word, I know there's a bit of debate around the word, but even us misfits who get inside the industry then do not feel uh, supported, yeah. included, um, um, comfortable. And that is a theme that's come through quite a, diff uh, quite a number of different things. So, so one of the most striking things that I've seen uh, since I started at Channel 4 is a piece of research um, which was actually done a year or so ago at Channel 4, talking to uh, BAME staff at Channel 4 uh, about how they felt about working at Channel 4. And, what, uh, and it's quite shocking. And what they were saying was, uh, we're here, but we don't feel we can be our authentic selves. We feel that there are all sorts of subtle behaviors, um, cues, uh, which make us feel uncomfortable. Um, you saw something very similar in the Sam Friedman class research. He talks about studied informality, I think is his phrase. All the sort of norms of behavior which make uh, some people who, uh, you know, when people use literary references in meetings, make people feel outsidery. For me, that's, that's, a, that's a huge piece that we've got to get our heads around. It's a, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a piece of empathy and listening and understanding about all the subtle ways that we uh, are excluding. There are, then, there are then a whole range of, of, of much more concrete things that we need to do. We, we, we at with Channel 4, we've, we've, we've made quite significant steps around just thinking about class, around creating uh, outreach pop-ups around the country to try and take the idea of working at Channel 4 to, to, to places where people might not think about it, we're, we're uh, creating apprenticeships for people without degrees, we're trying to fund traineeships. So there's a lot of quite concrete, specific actions. And then, I mean, the biggest thing of all, I hope, uh, will be the act of moving out of London and putting a substantial portion uh, of the Channel 4 staff, including a lot of new jobs, so I'm not just talking about people mm. moving from London, a lot of new jobs in Leeds. In, in, <laughs> well, okay. In, 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 in Leeds, Manchester or Birmingham, uh, and to regional hubs. And, and that in itself should diversify the staff of Channel 4 probably more in one single step than we could in perhaps years if we stayed in London. Um, the, the, one of the obligations of a PSB is to, in a sense, reflect the nation back to itself, make you know, British people feel, in a sense, represented. Um, I don't know if you've seen, I, I just a couple of days ago saw a magnificent new documentary by Sean McAllister called A Northern Soul, which is about, essentially about a white, uh, a, 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 a low-wage, white working-class man in Hull. Um, and, you know, part of Ofcom's criticism of all the PSBs is you don't do well enough in reflecting back the experience of whether it's um, black, Asian, ethnic communities or... Uh, you know, different kinds of sexual orientation, disability, across the range, they say you, you need to do better. But, it, I mean, interestingly, what Ofcom didn't talk about, but I personally think it's an issue in our fragmented nation, is, you know, where, this is, this is a film about the experience of a, somebody, a white working class man who basically feels disenfranchised. One of the great political challenges in this country at the moment is the sense of disenfranchisement, particularly by white working class men. Is that something you've thought about? Well, look, I mean, the, 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 the bigger picture there is the difference between representation 
and what I would call authentic portrayal, which mm. is the difference between ha between seeing on screen a, a wide range of different faces. Uh, but it's about a community they... feeling that you understand them. Yeah, but it's not just about white working class men. It's, no, it's about it's your not. content. It's about it's about not simply casting in diversity into uh, yeah, Hollyoaks or or any other story, but actually having stories, whether they're documentaries, dramas, authored pieces, which actually resonate with communities around the country who see their own life experiences reflect them. And Ackley Bridge is a fantastic example of a, of a, of a piece of drama that has, has really resonated with audiences who had not seen a lot of their um, experiences on screen. Derry Girls, the success of Derry Girls, I think, is, a, is an incredibly heartening uh, example of what, what, what can happen when you really reflect back a part of the country to themselves. Um, so in a minute, we're going to bring on some of your commissioning colleagues, but actually just as a sort of precursor, uh, w w w one of the many interesting questions that's been sent to me is, how much do you essentially let them just get on with the job, and how much are you yourself involved in the commissioning decisions? Well, I'm very keen to let them get on with the job as much as possible, and I've, I've said... Um, I said before I got this job that I would do it by empowering um, the commissioners around me. Um, it is the only way I can do the job um, because, as you know, um, there are huge parts of this job that I've never done. I was lucky enough when I arrived to inherit a pretty amazing team. Um, uh, really lucky to have Kelly Webb-Lamb, who is um, completely brilliant and I instantly recognised could do the job probably much better than me and so asked her to be my deputy. Uh, and over the last six, eight months, I've been building, along with some of the people there, uh, I think really fabulous team, Carl Warner coming to for Danny Horan, who you're going to meet in a second, who's our new head of Thatchel. And I think they are the most brilliant group of commissioners around, and I absolutely uh, want to run the place by finding out what they think the best telly to make is, and then helping them to make it. And before I bring them on, there's a particular bit of telly that you're proud of that I think it would be nice if you introduced. Yeah, it's called um, Married to a Paedophile, and, and I think it's a really great example of, of, of the kind of stuff I'd like to see on, on, on the channel more for two reasons, really. One is um, the subject matter. So this is an exploration of what happens to families when one family member, a man, is is convicted of a, a, a sex offence. It's not the kind of territory that I think most broadcasters would plunge into. It requires a degree of empathy with people who don't, who don't tend to receive any. Um, but the other thing that's fascinating about it, I think, is the, the device which uh, the filmmakers and Nick Mursky, who, who was our head of documentaries, have come up with to, mm. uh, to make it. It's made by um, Malcolm Brinkworth and Colette Camden. Um, and this is obviously a world in which it's incredibly difficult to get people to go on camera and talk. Um, we're talking to paedophiles and their families. Um, so the way they found to do this was to interview them, record their actual voices, and then get actors in to play them. So what you're about to see is actors lip-syncing the real uh, words and answers of the interviewees. Blimey, well, that was uh, powerful. Um, I'd like to bring on a, sort of three of your colleagues uh, now. So we've got your deputy, Kelly Webb-Lamb. Uh, we've got Fiona McDermott, the uh, head of comedy, and the head of factual, uh, Danny Horan. Good to see you all. Hello. 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 Um, so, uh, Kelly, what has Ian forgotten to say? <laughs> um, well, I think the most important thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, to just talk to people a little bit about peak time on Channel 4. Yep. Um, 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock in particular, which are our most important two hours of the day in mm -hmm. terms of audience share impact. Those two hours alone give us 
32% of our overall share. So they are kind of crucial to us. Yeah. Um, so uh, at eight o'clock, uh, my primary focus at the moment is about thinking about how we can revitalize and sort of really rethink what features and lifestyle means for a younger audience. Um, for that kind of Depop delivery generation who there's, there, I think there's been a sort of assumption that features is a genre for old people mm. and I don't believe that. I think young people care just as much about their lifestyles as the old folk like me. Um, and so we're sort of really thinking about that. What does it mean? Maybe they can't buy a house but that doesn't mean they don't care about what the house they live in is like, the flat they live in, the things that they you know, put in their lives to make their lives feel good. What do they do with their time? Um, but also really understanding that that generation care about the world around them and it isn't all kind of plastic surgery and Instagram. And so that's a massive priority for us. Um, and then at nine o'clock, actually before I talk about nine o'clock, mm. I think I've got a clip. So um, I just want to show you a clip of a show called Spying on My Family that the Garden have made for us, which is a lovely, innovative uh, idea, which is basically that a family for a week can watch whatever each other are doing at any time of day, wherever they are, and also have access to everything on their phones. So it's kind of grappling with the question of what social media and technology means for us in our domestic lives, um, and crucially kind of asking that question about if you had no secret screens but no secrets from the people that are closest to you, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? So let's have a look at this clip. A couple of things, really. I mean, we haven't got an enormous amount of time, so uh, take us through as brief as you can your plans for nine, but also I think there's quite a lot of interest in um, why you've appointed a, a new commissioner for E4, having not had one for a while, and what does it mean? Ian should answer that question, but um, the nine o'clock, I think that what I really love about that clip and that show is that we've gone back into the domestic space, but we managed to do it in a properly innovative way that feels fresh, and it is something we've never seen before, and I think that for nine o'clock is the absolute focus. It's about genuine innovation, it's about proper risk, whether that's about subject matter or whether that's about form. And really, we want to hear ideas that we've never heard before. So that's is properly ambitious for nine o'clock. And then... E4. The one-liner one on Carl is, is, is um, look, E4 is an incredibly strong youth brand. We think it can be much bigger than it is. We think it can be a really strong brand. Uh, uh, online, we think the channel can can have a bigger young share. We're investing in it. It's 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 done amazingly well over the last few years, but it's been a bit unloved. And perhaps uh, you, I think all channels need someone to obsess and have sleepless nights about them. And so uh, Carl is going to have sleepless nights about them before. And another bloke. Um, now, um, who's coming? Next, we've got Fiona next. Then. Yes, Hello. you're next in line. So, um, so tell us a bit about what, what what your great plans are for. I mean, comedy so much at the heart of what Channel Four has yeah. stood for. Did you watch Derry Girls? Almost since the beginning. Did you see Derry Girls this year? I didn't. Okay. Well, that was on television this year, and it was. And it was. Uh, I think one of the things I sort of want to say is, Ian started, and what he's done, in, he's done many things, but he has actually sort of gone. Comedy is important. I want to do more of it, which is phenomenal backing for a for a genre that's really hard to land, is expensive, but the you know but the pros to it are that it can become massively channel defining in a way that other genres can't. Mm. It's sort of a legacy genre. I've said this before, but if you get it right, your channel, you you have shows that define your channel and the, right. and the cultural uh, value of that for such a long time. So we've had an amazing year. Derry Girls, I think, landed in an almost unprecedented way as a cultural hit. Mm. Um, it did all the things we're all trying to speak to in a, in a brilliant way. And, you know, Hattrick and the exec producers there and, and Lisa just backed a really authored vision. And they, 
you know, it spoke to a regional audience in a way we just didn't realise felt so underserved, I think, but it also spoke to youngs and olds and olds? That's not what we call them, is it? They've got, they've got <laughs> another sort of... Like old. Is what you yeah, mean. but it's, you know, so, so we're sort of trying to build off the back of that and then we've also, you know, Friday Night Dinner had an amazing fifth series and we were able to yeah. do the Windsor's Wedding Special and so we have all these really big, broad hits which are really hard to get, but the balance for Channel 4 Comedy is always in how you get those new voices, which are harder to land, and you're breaking new voices in other more difficult arenas. Um, and we're doing that a lot. I've always struggled a little bit with how often we have to say no. We get a lot of people who want to make stuff for Channel 4 Comedy, and we don't have huge amounts of opportunity for that. So we develop a lot, and one of the things we've realised, and which is why we're sort of, um, which we're you know, we're going to launch a digital sandpit, money to invest in, in a more digital platforms and, and innovative content online is because we just want to say yes to more stuff. We've had really good success with how Blaps, which are our sort of really poorly named um, online <laughs> form, <laughs> sort of thing, um, have launched series. But there's definitely spaces around that that we're just not in. So what we're going to try and do over the next year with this extra uh, sort of injection of cash is start to commission some... Uh, just a more varied form, so two-minute pieces up to maybe three short, half, you know, twenty-minute pieces that form a mini-series from new writers. We want that to be more regional. We want that to be about new voices and new producers. We definitely can't. We're definitely saying no to people we should be saying yes to. So we want to create opportunity, and comedy is such a fantastic way to do that. So. And do you want to show us a clip? I do. I want to show you a show that's on Channel Four in October. It's called The Bisexual. Um, it's by, it's made by Sister Pictures. Um, it's written and performed and directed by the superstar that is Desi Akavan. She's just got a film out at the moment, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, and she's, a su I mean, she's a superstar. Um, it is about her journey as a, coming out as a bisexual. Um, it's as misfitty and Channel 4 and brilliant as it can get, I think. We're going to show a clip here where she's just come out of a 10-year relationship with Maxine Peake's character, and she's started a relationship with a man for the very first time and it's explaining the differences between having sex with a man and a woman. Um, Danny, factual Hello. also, absolutely the heart of what has made Channel 4 what it is over many years. Completely. What are you looking for? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm only six weeks in, so I'm sort of working that out a bit, but I, I'm lucky that I've inherited a huge department that is the engine, particularly at 9pm, which is 24 hours in a &E, custody, etc., educating, so that's amazing. However, I mean, we've been saying this for a long time at the channel, that they are probably, not all of them, are going to last forever. So we, I need to start to look at, partly the reason why I brought Nicola Brown in, as commissioning editor across Factual, is to look at new, bigger, returning series yeah. for 9 p.m. That's not necessarily in the blue flashing light space. I think ideally would be quite good to look at uh, more of the domestic space, and it's interesting what you're doing with Spine, the family, you got back into the sort of domestic space, which I would love to do as well, in a sort of more observed way, um, because we haven't done anything since the family on the channel, so that would be good to find. Um, also, 10 p.m. is a strategy that I'm going to sort of look at and whether we can start to do more uh, younger, skewed, edgy sort of series, longer running, potentially the sort of lower cost, like uh, stuff that BBC Three has been doing, um, like Drugsland, I think, is a, is a good example of that. I think that's the kind of thing that would work well at 10 p.m. for us. And then um, I'm determined to find... Um, in my time at the channel to find a doc's face who's going to, who will be a sort of somebody who will make six, eight films a year for us, at least one of those, I'm determined to find that. And is it could be new, could be existing, I don't know where I'm going to find it, um, and they're not easy to find, clearly. I mean, we haven't had anything in, in, in the documentary department for a really long time. And then just on Specialist Factual, just very, very quickly. Yeah. We, I think, like you say about comedy, it can be really channel-defining. I think that's exactly what Specialist Factual has done in the past, and we, I'm desperately trying to get back to that. So, Plane Crash, sort of our gay musical, is exactly Death of Klinghoff from quite a long time ago. But that's exactly the sort of thing that we need to look at again. So, looking at experiments, that sort of might, where some research has been done in the real world, that we can do a proper experiment that scientists or... Uh, research that universities can't afford to do. I mean, I say that because we're actually, that's what we're developing. 
um, that we're going to try and we're looking at a couple of those areas like gender power, our relationship with animals and eating, uh, being vegan, um, and we've got a sort of potentially uh, next plane crash type idea. Um, is, 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 is is there maybe? Is, I, I, I think there's a. I have a vague it's feeling that there is a clip that you'd like to talk into. Oh yes, sorry, yes, you're right. So there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a short clip, which is um, again, which is one of the things that I think Channel Four has been amazing at, is to look at how we do uh, sometimes uh, subjects where we can't quite get access to, but we do them in uh, using a different form. So obviously the paedophile was that, but this is something called the interrogation, which is the story of Tony Martin, the uh, man who uh, lived in his rural home in, a few years ago and, and, and killed a burglar, an intruder. And that's, so Steve Pemerton plays Tony Martin, and it's verbatim, the whole script is from the, is from the, is from the police interviews. Great. So sadly, that is all we have uh, time for. I'm obviously looking forward to the Channel 4 special in which our um, groundbreaking conversation is revoiced by actors. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, if you could put your hands together and, and, and uh, thank Fiona, Kelly, Danny and Ian and indeed our sponsors broadcast. Um, and a little plug from me, see you all for my Wednesday night show starting in September. <laughs> Cheerio.